And we're back with another episode of On the Record with Tiffany and Kevin. Okay, Justin. Uh, so we where we just left off is you were explaining to us about uh, where you're at in this process and some of the things that you've experienced. Um, where I am in this process is a place of freedom. I have somebody across the world um, writing a book about what has gone on. Um, and that's I Tom Mueller with How to Tom Make Mueller. a Killing. I'm sorry. I Tom, Mueller. Say that. Tom Mueller. Tom Mueller. Tom Mueller writing a book about um, the situation and the, and the disparity that, you know, the U.S. is going through with this. I myself have been up um, to our nation's capital twice to advocate. We um, we met with some powerful congressmen. I myself have um, found my own voice. I, I went to my um, congressman, Hank Johnson, here in the 4th District, and um, I have been letting them know uh, what's going on. Um, and Dr. And now, Rhonda Hamilton and, and uh, what is it? Healthy DC and me mm -hmm. that, you know, I've, I've been looking at, at uh, what Dr. Hamilton is doing. And uh, in the first, is it the first ward or the eighth ward in DC where 44% of their kidney eighth population ward. is yeah. the eighth ward. Eighth ward, um, yeah. And you got to tour that because that that's a very interesting microcosm there in Washington, D.C. We we're talking about the nation's capital. And the, the nation's capital. And it the, was so surprising. The kidney disparity the there is just alarming. You would think that with us being the leaders of the free world, that we we wouldn't have people living like they're in the third world right in it the was, nation's capital. Yeah, it was mm. actually um, touring that was it was what made me stand up um, at, at a point. I I had gotten complacent. I thought this was my life and I felt like if I had just made a legacy with my work and the things that I was doing and I died, I would be happy. And going to the eighth ward, I saw elderly uh, elderly woman. She sat on her toilet. She flushed the toilet and water started running through the top of her roof. This guy my age. Um, and that was really, he was living in the, his, the flooring was so wet. Like it was like walking on. And then you could see the mold in the kitchen. You can see the mold. Like he, like, I didn't even want, I, I just, I immediately, and he's sitting there and his dog, he had two dogs and the dogs, they had pissed all around. And you could tell those was his only, the only people he had was his dogs. And it was just, it was sad. I just left. I was like, at that point, um, and we saw other people, but at, at certain points it made me realize like, look how blessed I've been. Look how I've been I, I've been terminated like four or five times. Um, I I have had like from the dialysis from the region, center from, from the from the dialysis center, and um, it had to be brought back because of this. I've had like I told you that Atlanta, Atlanta Journal Constitution um, thing written up, and that actually saved my life because at that moment they were trying to kill me. Um, and, and the Atlanta Arlene, Journal featured you. You know, the and, the thing about it is that you... No, they featured the dialysis company. Featured the, and, yeah, the, the dialysis 45, company. The 45 counts that they found. They, <laughs> at that point, they had, they had pushed me into um, my clinic that I'm in now because if they had investigated, then they would have seen that they illegally terminated me. So they got me right. into a place really quick, but they still got 45% right. of, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. 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 You know, when I look at you, I, it just is um, like the perfect storm because you are a person who is uh, healthy. Arlene and, always said that. Yes, and, and Arlene, Arlene is right. Arlene did a great job. Thank you to Arlene for saving your life and coming in and really realizing that there was something fundamentally wrong with what right. was happening. Um, and she's been at this for a long time. 
uh, with, 26 with, years with a lot of people's, uh, you know, saving a lot of people's lives because uh, this is just egregious. What's happening is just just egregious. You know, the fact that that uh, there are certain players that can come into this and not only behave this way, uh, but but have others do so as well. It is it's seriously what we have noticed is that this is indoctrination. That's why I'm always talking about the fact that uh, you have to have people like you who are independent voices. They have not worked for industry. Deliver me from all of these folks that have worked for 20 years, 30 years uh, for industry because it's very hard to not get indoctrinated into anything. I don't care what it is that you're doing. If you work within a certain system for 20 or 30 years, you are indoctrinated into that system. You can believe you're not, and, and but you are. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to say. It, it's um, it's a system. It's systematic. Yeah, it is. And it's, uh, it's almost like a, uh, like the jail. or it, it's, it's, it's so many, but... I, I think I ran into that word so much when I went to um, Washington. It's, it's systematic. It's like mm -hmm. it's like it's like they poison the food to get you at this point. Um, when you really when you really think about you know um, Operation Paperclip when our government brought over the Nazis and then mm -hmm. them just playing playing with <laughs> with us. You know what I'm saying? But like with it's this been going on for years, so it's. Well, this, it, it is. It's systemic. Like when you when you look at this and look at the, the comfort that people have in in doing some of the stuff that they did to you and they do to others all over the country. Listen to what the words are that are being used over and over again. Noncompliant. Always uh, that that the individual is is uh, aggressive and combative. It's the same. That's the playbook. You know, it's the, That's the playbook. You know, exactly. That's the playbook. playbook. Exactly. Yeah. But, but why why aren't we learning from history when we look at people like Henrietta Lacks and we see she went in there because she was sick. Mm -hmm. And they're still using her genes today, and nobody wants right. to admit it. Nobody's mm -hmm. giving her family money. They Everybody's just have. suffering. They just, they just have. But look, look at how many decades went by before they found this is. And, it's like what, what her grandchildren that are now getting it. Yeah. The, and and yeah. it's mainly, and it's the same uh, from that same playbook. Uh, over and over again, we see the same things being given to. Uh, to black people, it's a statue and and a name on a building, and you know a few right. dollars comp as opposed just the position against the trillions of dollars and the billions of dollars that were made off of this person's um, um, genetic DNA. You know, you, uh, but you, but we're not even talking about her daughter. I mean, that just disappeared. It's very, I, and she was she was special too. You know, you, you when you look at these things, there is a but the the whole dynamic of how that was done. Yes, today we're in a different environment, but we we're in a in you know the same environment because we've the got much environment. of a, we've just got mm -hmm. a new set of systems of that don't that that don't work to the advantage of the patient that work to the advantage. Of the entities that are that are governing it, and it's it is very, you know, I, nobody in the United States is against people making money. The United States is a capitalistic mm -hmm. country. However, the you don't have to make money off the backs of the sick. You can health care should be care. Health care, increasing your helping you manage your health, keep your health. You that that should be the top priority of professionals within that system. Mm. However, what we see 
is that there there are the system itself is set up in such a way where the majority of the money is made off the sickest people. And so you have right, an right. entire system that is even in the reporting. It's not, kidney disease is detected in stages 1, 2 and 3A, but it's not reported or diagnosed until stage 3B at 3 months. Well, you've lost a significant portion of your kidney function at stage 3B. And the reality is is that's best practices, stage 3B. That's what best practices says. The reality is is that most people aren't diagnosed (laughs) until stage 4. Mm-hmm. So and that's how I was much diagnosed you, stage four. Exactly. And, wow, you know, wow. so, so and where and, does the and, profit and go up at is, between I, stages three and four? Profits increase by 40%. So. Like, my thing is, what happened <laughs> when you go to the doctor all these times before? And they're mm-hmm. checking you because I was regularly checked. Like, what? what, what is this? So, that's, yeah. so this is where the systems part comes into play. Mo- with doctors... Doctors are following protocols. They're not, you know, it's not a group think or conspiracy against people. They're following protocols. So there's a protocol for diabetes, a protocol for hypertension, and they do whatever the checklist is for that protocol. Kidney disease is not on either of those protocols, nor is it on the cardiovascular protocol, nor is it on the obesity protocol. And it should be simply Check for the ACR. Check for the for uh, the the uh, GFR. I, I always want to say EGFR because it used to have the estimated uh-huh. on there. But but GFR is glomerular filtration rate. ACR is albumin creatinine ratio. Those two tests tell you whether a person how a ki- person's kidneys are functioning and how much damage has been done to the kidney. You would know right there. If that were tested for, and it is tested for, it's not reported. So the the recommendation is that you re, you report a diagnosis. You know, people are interpreting; they're not telling them when to report. But most most doctors are going to report to you or tell you when they diagnose you with something. They're not going to tell you about something that they haven't diagnosed you with. If it's, there's not a diagnosis for it. So that is where the confusion it seems to lie. That's that's what we we see as the space where the confusion lies. Is that the that it's not in the protocols, even though it's there, and, and it's literally, hey, just right. just tell people what this is. Tell them what it is. You got, you know, eighty percent kidney function. You've got twenty percent damage, or whatever it is for this person. Put it in the protocol and tell them. That's literally, you could change numbers right there. And in a matter of five years, you can project out the percentage of people's well-being and then dollar percentages that would be uh, saved. Right, right. Right there, right there. But but you, again, you're dealing with... That is literally what the what is wrong systematically, because a an individual doctor uh, putting it, you know, there are some doctors that are going to come right up to you and go, hey, wait a minute, there's a problem with this. Let me let me talk to uh, Reginald about where he's at with his uh, diabetes and how his kidneys are being affected by this diabetes. There's right. there's the doctor there are there are doctors that will do that but if you think about what a primary care physician is is expected to do every day and with each patient they only see you for a short period of time they're dealing with all of the comorbidities that you have kidney disease is a secondary thing you most people who are who have Kidney disease, they have diabetes, hypertension, right. cardiovascular disease, obesity, a combination of all three or one of each one. Um, and so that doctor is yeah. trying to deal with those things. Right, right, right. They're dealing with, with that stuff. And so if you don't 
put on on their protocols, what it is, how kidney disease relates to this, and that it needs to be talked to, uh, needs to be reported to the patient. If, if that is not there, they're not going to do it. They're not even no. thinking about it. They're thinking about all this other stuff that they that is there, that they are graded on. It's, you know, quote, unquote, graded on, and that, yeah. that uh, they need to get done. It's not that they're out trying to do something nefarious. It's that this system is not conducive to them doing what's right on this the, in this area. It's got to be added to the protocols. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? That's and, right. And we've got to have we've got to have more of a a preventative slant in this country. Amen. You know, people should be looking at uh, not how many more transplants you can do, but how how much preventative work can you do on this? And it can't be just, oh, we want to do more transplants. I want us to do more transplants, too. But I also want to help those transplant surgeons and the transplant community by heading off kidney disease uh, in the people who that we can head it off in at the beginning. You'd much rather mm-hmm. keep. I, I want to keep my kidneys. I don't want to have to get a transplant. I have a right. rare kidney disease, and I'm doing everything I can do to make sure I keep my kidneys, that I follow what they're asking me to follow, and I keep my kidneys, as opposed to having to go and get a transplant. And you can do that. Mm-hmm. You can you with food, with lifestyle, with uh-huh. SGLT two eyes, with the new therapeutics. There's all kinds of ways you can slow this yeah. down. But even after own kidney, um, and and, ha- and having lost your kidneys, there are things that you can do. What they what they um to be healthy and to live with it. It's to be healthy, but they. Most people look at it, oh, okay, well, I'm going to go into dialysis and I'm going to eat whatever I want to. And you you find that happens so much. And what I've come to terms with is that's a PTSD or a state of depression. When somebody knows something's going to kill them and they're eating something, like I told my um, my social worker, I told them that I have an eating problem because if I'm eating things that's going to hurt my body and I continue to eat them, then that's an addiction and that's a problem. She said, oh, Mr. Evans, you're healthier than everybody. You're healthy. You're, it's nothing wrong with you. You know, But, but never uh, negating the fact that I'm recognizing in myself that I'm still eating things that I'm, I, I don't or I shouldn't eat, which I've worked on. But mm-hmm. what I'm telling you is I've come to them and said that. So how many people that are way out of shape of me? You see what right. I'm saying? Right, they, right. They, they have no no knowledge of that at all, that there's a problem. Well, and you touched on something no that's help. important. You touched on something huh? that's important when we talk about systemic issues with uh, the mental health. Because mm-hmm. there's not – mental health is as important as your physical health. It you, surely is, and that's really, what I've realized. You really can't achieve your physical health that you need without mm-hmm. a strong mental health. A strong and that's mental what health. I feel they do. I feel they break down the mental. And once you broke down somebody's mental, it's easy for them to do the rest of the work for you. That's what I was doing for them. I was doing the work for them. I said, oh, my God, if I can continue to work for Kevin Hart and do a few more movies and just make a name, I I don't have to make a lot of noise. And they were killing me. And then when I died last year, I realized I was going to die either way. So I am going to make some noise. That's what made me realize it. You know, people, people that are doing the work for them. When I when I had all those people sign that um, that petition, they came back and they harassed those people just like they harassed me. So you had some dialysis people, patients sign a petition that was sent to, to Senator Isaacson. All of this mm-hmm. is on record, too. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and they, they harassed, harassed those, people. those people, too. And those people told lies on me. They said that I had I rung them up and had them to do that. And I had a hatred for patients because I was feeling like I wasn't even doing this for myself. And I started realizing it's a slave mentality. Mm-hmm. The slave person had to tell on, on this other slave that was trying to help them <laughs> to save yeah. their own yeah. life. Yeah. 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 These yeah. people stick us every day. 
But yeah. well, that yeah. tells you the the level of intimidation too that people back. It's very they, so intimidating. They backed up, and and backed back what they were saying because they were scared. Yeah, when they when they have meetings, I've even mentioned this too because I have meetings all the time, contracts all the time. They will have two or three people come to you, and I've had to make this a thing at every clinic. Don't talk to me when my blood is getting sucked out of my arm. <laughs> because yeah. you're telling me you're telling me things about my diet. You're telling me things that's going to make my blood pressure go up and down. And again, I need my arrhythmia to go the same way when I'm doing it. When I sit there, I sometimes meditate, go to sleep or do something. But why come and say stressful situations? The only time your doctor sees you is when you're on that chair. Mm-hmm. Imagine what it's like to have your or have things being sucked your your blood. Yeah. sucked out of you. You're you're in a tired state. You're in a relax, and this person's coming to tell you detrimental stuff. Oh, your potassium's high. You know, if your potassium's I get too high, your heart's just exactly. gonna stop there, exactly. son. So you don't want it. You don't want that. To, start. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me that at a different time? <laughs> <laughs> and um, can until, t- can you talk talk about you? You mentioned that that you died. You uh-huh. died for. Can you? Lead us up to to that. What what happened? Up to that, I haven't had, um, and I haven't spoken on this either. I haven't had disability. They mm-hmm. said I had an overpayment mm-hmm. of forty three thousand dollars. They told me this, and I knew I was working. So I said, okay, I'll just let it go. Two years later, I I was getting twenty three um twenty three thousand a year. And disability, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. When it when it all added up, about twenty three thousand. So I figured in two years it they would have been paid back. So I didn't get this disability for two years. Come the third year, I'm I'm trying to get my disability because I know I haven't worked in the last two years. I, I I stopped everything. Which in my worst situation, I'm still able to work. I'm still probably better than most in their best situation. Needless to say, I'm trying to. So you had go to stop with working so that you could. I had to let literally. I, I disability. Just I just stopped. Paid back. So on the third year, they sent me another letter. You owe forty three thousand dollars. I said, Well, hold on, how I owe forty three thousand dollars? In fact, y'all are now owe me money because we're in the third year. So twenty twenty three twenty three twenty three. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I I um I then start going. At this point, I'm I'm. I'm only living off my residuals, what mm-hmm. I've made in film. Cause you know, as you know, in film, you get residual pay. Right. I work my butt off for a reason so I can get my house because I knew I had this, this chronic, this chronic Ill, chronic illness. Right. And I, and I felt like I wanted somewhere secure. So I work my butt off. So when they asked, when they said the money, I didn't, I didn't argue with them to make a long story short. They say I owe forty three thousand dollars, and I'm calling and I'm I'm questioning, and this I'm still trying to work on. I need an attorney. I I call them and they say, well, it's an overpayment due to drug addiction and alcoholism. I say, I say what? Now at this point, my dad is going through pancreatic cancer. I'm in Mississippi, and I'm just calling because my mom is staying on me. I'm like, I don't care about these people. At this point, I'm pr- pretty much suicidal. Now that I know in my head, I don't care. You see what I'm saying? They're going to do what they're going to do anyway. And and that's where I am. But my mom's like, keep calling Social Security, keep calling. And and when they said that, I said, overpayment due to drug addiction. Because the guy, he didn't really want to um, say it. And, and, and needless to say, I recorded him on the, on the line um, when he was saying it. And so I get back up there. i like, I got to get this in proof. Mm-hmm. Because I have never heard this a day in my life. And so I go up there. And I asked the person and he just he he's sitting there. And of course, I, uh, I, I have my phone so everything can be heard. Right. And um, he's sitting there. And he He's beating around the bush and he's beating around the bush. He said, I don't know what it is. And I said, well, um, when I called earlier, they said uh, overpayment due to drug addiction. He said, yeah, I see that. But I didn't want to say that because I've never seen that before a day in my life. And he's like, I, I said, well, I'm going to need proof of that. So I got it in writing. I have it. I have it printed out that they said that. 
since then, I have asked supervisor uh, Mrs. Biggers. Been to her four times. I had no money. My lights are on and off. In fact, right now, my lights, my, my bill is like $1,000. I have all electricity. Hmm. So I went to Mrs. Biggers about four times. Um, she didn't know anything about it. She'll she'll get back to me. These are the games the Social Security Administration plays in Georgia. You go in the you go in the room. There's this sixty screen TV that's flashing numbers and calling out this stuff. And you get there and you look at the screen and then you act like the screen is telling you what to do. And they say, "Oh, the screen don't work. Don't don't mind the screen." Then you ask the police, you ask, no, no, seriously. You ask the policeman questions. And, and this is me on my last leg. I'm having problems paying the $12 to park. Mm-hmm. So me going in there and then they're, they're yelling. At one point, I think I got in trouble because I was helping this 80-year-old blind. She was blind and she she really could comprehend any a lot of anything, hardly walking. She gets up there. Now the police, they'll tell you quickly. They're very, very rude to you, but they'll tell you quickly that, hey, we don't work for the Social Security. You got to figure everything else out yourself. But if you do anything out the way, so this lady, she's trying, she asked him, she said, sir, ma'am, I can't help you with nothing. So I get up and I go over and I help the elderly lady. And and they they attacked me like you would have thought I was. Doing. And, and the, the lady turned and she said, sir, you wouldn't help me. Please let this young man help me. I can't see. I can't do nothing. I asked y'all several times. And see, and these they, are the things finally, that you're, and that's a, that is very difficult. Like the mental piece of that. It, no. Uh, no, hold, no, 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 Hold this, hold this thought. We, you've been listening to On the Record with Tiffany and Kevin on 930 AM, The Answer, and we will be back. 